Hi, welcome back. In part 1.1 of this tutorial, I looked at the advantages and also some of the considerations around implementing a multi-symbol EA. In this part, we're going to get into the detail of the code and look at all of the components that are required in order to implement that multi-symbol capability. So what you'll remember from part one is that I stated I wouldn't be providing you with a fully functional trading EA. What I would do is provide an expert advisor that had all of those critical components in order to give you that multi-symbol capability. And the idea is that you can take those and implement them in your own single symbol EA to give it that multi-symbol capability. So let's start to take a look at some of those components. So if we start with the input section, the most important one here is the trade symbols input variable. And this is where you specify which symbols it is that you want to trade. Now you have a number of options here. The first option is to simply list the, um, the symbols that you wish to trade delimited and in my case, I've used a pipe symbol to delimit them. But if you wanted to change the code, then you could delimit them with whichever symbol you wanted. So that's the, that's the first option. So in this case, I'd just be trading these five symbols. Alternatively, as you can see from the comment here, if I set this to a value of all, what the code will then do is use the symbols that are stored within this variable, this global variable here. So in this particular case, there are 22 symbols there. And the reason for that is it gets over a limitation in MQL5, whereby the maximum number of characters you can have in an input variable is 242. And so if your list of symbols exceeds that, you'll still be able to implement additional symbols just by simply selecting all in for the value in this one here, and it will use whatever's in here. And of course, there's no limitation here of that degree. So if I just change that back. The next two inputs really are here just as an example. So I wanted to use a indicator within this multi-symbol EA just to illustrate how you would access that for each of the different symbols. And so in this particular case, I've just chosen to use Bollinger Bands as, as an example, but of course it could be any indicator that you have. So let's move on to the other uh, global variables and probably the only other one other than this worthy of note is symbol array. And this will store a list of the symbols in array format, as opposed to just being stored as a string value that's provided in the, in the input variable here. And equally, if you've chosen all and you're using this, then it will, it will, it will store these also as a string array, which just makes processing uh, a lot easier as we get into the, the details of the code. You'll also notice I declare my indicator handles as globals here, and these have also been declared as arrays. So the handles for the Bollinger Band, if, if this is cell zero, this would be storing the handle for Aussie CAD for the value of cell one, it would be storing the handle for Aussie Yen and so on. And then I have, have another array here, which is called open trade order ticket. And this is just an array that stores the order tickets for any open trades. So once again, this is an array that maps directly onto the symbols that you're trading. So the default value for the, for every cell in this is zero when we don't have a trade open. But if, for example, cell one stored a, a non-zero order ticket, then that would mean that there was an open trade currently for Aussie Yen. If cell two stored an order ticket, it would mean that Aussie Kiwi had an open trade currently. 
And then as soon as those trades are closed, the values are reset to zero so that we know that those trades are no longer open in our code. And this is just a way that I manage my own trade management. Now, I'm sure that you probably manage things in a different way. Uh, and so you'll just have to transfer the logic over to your own methodologies. Um, but as I say, this is how I do it. And so this is, this is what I'll be showing you today. So let's turn our attention now to the onInit function. And the top part of this function is concerned with populating the symbol array that we saw a moment ago, and also populating the number of tradable symbols. So the first part of this is when the input variable is set to the value of current. So you'll remember from here, we have three options. We can either specify the list of symbols, we can state all to use this uh, list here, or if we select current, then it will convert the EA to a single symbol and just use the symbol from the chart that the EA is running on. So when that's the case and the user has selected current, it just sets the number of tradable symbols to one, sizes the array to um, one cell, and sets the first cell of symbol array to the symbol of the chart that the EA is running on. Otherwise, it comes down to this section here. And if, if the trade symbols is, has been set to all, then this temporary variable is set to the all symbol string that we saw here. Otherwise, it's simply set to the value of the symbols that are listed in the input variable. That then goes through the string split function, which populates the symbol array with each of those delimited by the pipe value, as you can see there. So if you wanted to change that delimiter, this is where you would change it. And the value returned from that is the number of tradable symbols. So it does two things in one, it populates the symbol array and it also sets the number of tradable symbols variable. So now, regardless of which option we've chosen, we have both of those uh, variables set. So moving on, the next thing that happens is that we now resize all of the core arrays that are used by the EA now that we know how big those arrays are. So if we take a look at this one first of all, at the moment we're only looking at one array, which is this open trade order ticket, which if you remember is used to store the order ticket for open trades. Otherwise, this is set to zero to indicate that the trade isn't open for that particular symbol. And so we just size this to the number of tradable symbols, which we've just already ascertained in on in it. The second one is resizing the indicator handle arrays. And so if we go to that, As you know, we're just using the Bollinger Bands indicator in this particular example. And so what this does is it sizes that particular handle array, again, to the number of tradable symbols. Now in both of these functions, you would add your own additional arrays that would need to be sized. So if you were, for example, also storing the direction of the trade or the open price of the trade, or whatever aspect of that you want to store as, as variables for use by the, the EA, you would add them underneath here. And likewise, if you were using multiple indicators in your expert advisor, you would size those handles for those. So for example, if you're using MACD or stochastic, you would add handles for those indicators below here to make sure that they were sized to the relevant number of symbols. So then the final thing that we have to do in on init is actually set up those indicators. So we've already sized them to the number of symbols. Now we need to actually instantiate them. And so if we take a look at this, you can see here, 
we have a, a simple loop that goes through each of the symbols between zero and the number of tradable symbols. And for each of those representing a symbol, we set the handle using symbol loop as the, the cell value here to the value of the indicator. So in this case, it's the Bollinger Bands I bands indicator. And note that the symbol that we're passing into that is the symbol array based on, again, symbol loop from here. And so this would just pass in Euro dollar or Aussie dollar or whatever the symbol is at that point. And so that would set up then, if you're, for example, trading 22 symbols like I do, it would run through this loop 22 times and it would, it would instantiate 22 Bollinger Band handles, one for each symbol. You can also see here the other two input variables that I defined above for the number of periods and the number of deviations. Now, if that succeeds, the loop continues on to the second one and so on. If, however, there is a problem, so the handle is set to invalid handle, then we have to do some error checking. And the most common reason for this to happen is error 4302, which means that the symbol that you've tried to set a handle for is not listed in the market watch window. And so because this is the most common, I have a specific if statement to catch this. And here we just tell, inform the user that the symbol needs to be added into the market watch. Otherwise, for any other error, we simply output the error code by getting the last error here. And then because this is on in the on init function, we want to make the user aware of this straight away. And so the evident way of doing that is by using a message box. And so we just inform the user that um, the creation of the handle failed. We provide them with the output message, which is either this one or this one and inform them that the EA will terminate so that they can rectify the problem and restart the expert advisor. And if we do ever experience any problem for any of those handles that are being created, then we return the value of false, which of course then returns init failed, which stops the EA. If that doesn't happen, we reach this final command, which is init, init succeeded and the EA continues to run. So click on the link to part 1.3, where I'll be looking at the functions required in OnTick and also looking at the EA running on a live chart.